Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, don't be alarmed. I'm not going to lead the uh, singing this morning, but we have had a, uh, uh, a slight change. Uh, Brother Randy is going to be our, uh, our lead song leader from now on. Um, so I just wanted to give an introduction to him and, and thankful for him following the Lord's leading uh, in this. So, Brother Randy, come and lead us in our opening hymn. Good to see everyone. Page uh, 461. 461. All stand and sing. He leaded. Nice to see such a good crowd here on this uh, on this blustery uh, Lord's Day morning uh, that we have before us today, and uh, just found out that uh, Beckley the roads are covered in Beckley, so a little bit of a flip of how the script usually runs because Flat Top Mountain is clear, but who knows what the rest of the day will hold for us all? But I'm I'm glad you're all here this morning. I. Y'all, I, I did not fire Dad as song leader. I think over the over the last few years, I know that he has mentioned that several times. Uh, as he's he called me ancient this morning, and he's my dad. So the uh, the capacity, the range is just not what it was. And he had been praying, and we we had been praying for somebody to. To be able to step in and, and God put that on Randy's heart to do that and so anyways we're uh, just thankful it the music is so important now, even the scripture tells us um, that we are to worship God with our uh, our the songs and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody in our heart it's part of our of our corporate worship and uh, with without the the instruments and the and the singers, the leading, the song leading, uh, that aspect, even the offertory, the prelude and the postlude. If you've ever been to church where 
that was absent, you know how loud that absence is. And so we're, I'm just so thankful. God just supplies all of our needs uh, according to his riches and glory. So that's all I'm going to say about, about that. Uh, a little bit of a, of a different church setting for us this morning. Of course, we're having our normal um, worship service uh, right now. Um, and those of you that maybe didn't get the text uh, that I sent out, uh, with the uh, with the impending bad weather and the just uh, the way things have gone today with with our weather, we have uh, moved our. We were supposed to have our business meeting this evening, and um, so we're moving that to immediately at the conclusion of this church service. There's nothing new on the. And on the books that I know of, so it should only add about 10 or 15 minutes to our service, and then this will be uh, at the conclusion of our business meeting. We won't have a, an evening uh, uh, service. So this will be our only service of the day, but we do want to have our business meeting. If you're under time constraints, if you need to leave, that's, that's perfectly understandable after we have the invitation if you want to just quietly uh, get up and leave, you're welcome to. But I hope you can all, you're all welcome to stay uh, for for our uh, business meeting. This is our quarterly business meeting. Okay, so no service this evening. Business meeting immediately following at the conclusion of the morning service. Um, and is that all the announcements that we need to make? Anything else? No. Okay. Um, well, we want to go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, interestingly, I, we just got our, our prayer letter from Brother Rudy Rico in the mail, um, and it's just an update on his ministry there, but, and I will post this on the bulletin board. But more importantly, <clears throat> we uh, just got notified, as some of you know, uh, that we sent some money to help with his medical expenses. Brother Rudy has been admitted to the hospital there in the Philippines uh, was spitting up blood and uh, having difficulty breathing. And they did a, a CT chest scan and they discovered some problems. Uh, uh, I talked to his daughter. They're going to schedule him, I think, for a bronchioscope and try to clean some things out and, and possibly facing even uh, some lung surgery do not have a diagnosis for him yet, but he's a very sick man, and we certainly want to uh, remember uh, Brother Rudy uh, in our prayers. Also, uh, Nestor uh, Tadwan, he texted me this morning and said that Sheila ha has been sick the last couple of days and asked us to pray for her as well. So uh, specifically for Brother Rudy, Sheila, and the and the rest of our missionaries, we want to continually lift them up to the Lord in, in prayer. And uh, many of our church folks have been out sick. Some are still out. Good to see Brother Clay back. And I, I know uh, Sister Viola, we keep her keep her in our prayers, Sister Helen. Um, and we just, we just you know, this, this time of year, there's just so much that's been going on. So uh, we want to remember all these uh, that, that we have on our prayer list and uh, perhaps there's a, a need that you'd like to bring before the church uh, before we go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Any prayer requests? Brother Bill Worley? There's uh, Junior Moore. He's a preacher down at Raleigh. Uh-huh. And uh, he's been sick for quite a while. Okay. He went to the hospital and had some kind of surgery, and he, uh, he's out dying on the table. Okay. Okay, okay. Um, and, and you said it was his last name Moy, Jr. Moy? Jr. Moy. Okay, okay. Well, let's remember him in prayer, certainly. Uh, Stephen Debbie's Arthur's a grandson. Uh, it isn't Maddox, it's um, Maverick. 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 It, they kept him overnight uh, there in Charleston. Uh, his potassium was low, and they're trying, to, I guess, to get some get some answers as to what was going on with him. But uh, I, I work with um, uh, Jeff, that's uh, Debbie's brother, and he's the one that, that gave me the prayer request yesterday. And 
So he was doing a little bit better uh, in, in the hospital, but continue to remember him in prayer as well. All right. Uh, a lady I work with, um, her mom, Carol Upson, has a leaky heart valve. And Dawn knows my friend's been in the ER with her since yesterday. Okay. So, and she's got a one year old, so it's been kind of, I'm sure it's hard on her. To, sure. So I just pray she gets the help she needs. Right. Amen. We will. I have a cousin. His name is uh, Christopher Bragg. He called me a couple of days ago and said he had like a uh, a tumor on his arm, and they uh, they did a biopsy, and the cell. Of course, it is a cancer cell, but I looked it up to you know medical books and stuff. But this is a fast growing type of cancer. Just remember him in sure. your prayers and. Uh, what I remember about him in our youth as we sort of grew up together, uh, of course he got married, he's got two kids, and his daughter now is getting ready to graduate, but he was such a good father to those kids. <clears throat> you know, it's it's something you see a good daddy that really takes care of the kids, and he has, and he's had him in church, and he's been such a good father to them because he had a terrible life as a kid growing up. It was awful. Okay. But, um, I'm just well, praying that you know, hurry and get surgery, that it won't grow, but uh, sure. it says it's fast spreading and it's just not good. Amen. Not good. Well, let's remember remember him in prayer, certainly. And uh, Jackie? Remember our granddaughter, Rosa Morgan? Uh-huh. She's expecting in March, and her hemorrhoid is really low. And pray to God and let her know. Okay. Did Malia make her flight home? She did. Okay, so she's home safe. That's yeah. good. She missed her flight in London, but then she got a later one. She well, made it in. well, good. It's a long ways to go. Mm -hmm. Any? Was there another one? Um, well, let me. Those of you that maybe do not know, or uh, we haven't said a lot about it, but. We're, me and Mary's gonna be traveling Wednesday evening to uh, Cleveland Clinic. Uh, she's gonna have to have a pretty major surgery on Friday. Uh, and so we just ask that you just pray for us, uh, pray for her. Thursday, uh, she's got a very difficult pre-op uh, appointment that she's very concerned about for, uh, and, uh, and then several appointments on Thursday and then uh, the surgery to prepare uh, hiatal hernia uh, so yeah anyways this it's um we covet your prayers uh, for these for this week that's ahead of us especially for her uh, what she's facing remember brother uh, paul holstein and lord willing if if the weather holds uh, okay uh, he's going to he's going to be filling in on uh, sunday morning this coming lord's day so <clears throat> uh, hopefully we'll be back We'll be traveling home on Sunday or Monday. Not really sure. It just depends on the recovery for her. I'll keep everybody updated as we go, but uh, do keep Mary in your prayers. Anything else before we go to the Lord in prayer? Well, if you have an unspoken request for prayer, would you lift your hand and, and God sees these hands. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for for this day and I'm thankful for uh, the faithfulness of, of your people here at Camp Creek and those that have uh, braved the weather to be here uh, this morning. I pray uh, for a, a special blessing on them and those that are not able to be here and just pray that you would be with them and encourage them. And uh, we're thankful that we have this opportunity to gather in your name. And so, uh, guide our worship this morning and our business meeting and all that we do. I do pray for these prayer requests that, that are on our prayer list and those that we have sent out in text this week and, and, and mentioned this morning. Each and every need, you know about all of them intimately. 
and you are at work. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, draw the loss to yourself. There's many circumstances in, in life with sickness and, and all kinds of events uh, that can bring people to a point of desperation, especially those that do not know you. And I pray that uh, these that are on our prayer list in that situation uh, that do not know you, that, that you would draw them to yourself and save them by your marvelous grace, that, uh, that each and every one who is going through these difficulties will be drawn to you. If they know you and are away or wayward, that you would draw them back to you and just pour your, your love and goodness and forgiveness upon them. And, and for these that are sick, those that, that know you, I pray you would give each one strength. Strength for the journey that lays ahead, the strength to, to be joyful and rejoicing in spite of the circumstances we find ourselves in. That we would seek out in the midst <clears throat> of adversity and trial and sickness and even in grief. That as your children we would we would seek your face and that you would lead us to have a testimony for you that, as I mentioned so often, that we would shine as lights in the darkness, a world that has no hope, that we would be a reflection, uh, a display of the hope that is in us, in Jesus Christ our Lord. So, Father, be with each need, answer according to your will, and help us to serve you and follow you. Be with us in the remainder of this service for the singing and the praising, the praying, for the preaching of your word and the hearing of your word. Have full control over me, and each person here, and may your will be done in our lives for your honor, for your glory, and for our eternal good. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Page 295. Stand and sing, revive us again. Heart with my love.
That song certainly goes with the morning message. Uh, but before that, have we had any uh, birthdays this past week, Bill or Early? <laughs> you wouldn't even we'll give Jackie a chance to write you out, were you? Amen. Well, happy birthday, brother. Thankful for another year the Lord's given you. Anybody else? Oh, Dex Dexter's birthday's tomorrow. Well, Praise the Lord, Brother Dexter. Thankful for the, another year the Lord's given you. That's a blessing. Oh, we got two birthdays. Uh, we have a third. Sounds like an auction, doesn't it? <laughs> going once, going twice. Let's say happy birthday to Brother Bill and Brother Dexter. <clears throat> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. God bless you. Happy birthday to you. <clears throat> How about wedding anniversaries? <clears throat> Y'all are glad I'm not leading the singing, right? <laughs> hey, maybe we can get Randy to do that part. Uh, we'll, we'll give him a week or so. <laughs> uh, any wedding anniversaries? All right. Well, at this time, if the ushers will come, uh, let's worship the Lord with our tithes and our offerings. <clears throat> Brother Alan Bell, would you lead us in prayer, please? Almighty Father, we thank you, Lord, for each and everything that you do, of course, Lord. We ask that you continue to watch over us and help us to do your will, Lord. We ask now that you bless this offering and help us to use it to further your glory, Lord. In Christ's holy name I pray, amen. Amen. For the morning message, uh, Sister Judy Christian is going to come and sing a special song. Seventy-seven. I thought, well, we got another year, and I thank the Lord I 
DLC 24. But I also thought about what's going on in this world, our nation. This is election year. Got the war in Israel, Ukraine. It's sad. I mean, people are facing sickness, death. But one thing for sure we know, the anchor holds. Hey. 
I have often said that the, the purpose, all, all of the aspects of our worship service, uh, it, it is, all, is all part of our worship, every aspect of it. And the singing, all of it, is to glorify the Lord as, as part of our worship. And I say often, especially the, the specials, and I'm so thankful for those that have the ability and the willingness to, uh, to, to sing the special song before the morning message, that the purpose of that is to prepare our hearts to receive God's word. And those that do this in our church uh, are very sensitive to the leading of the Spirit over and over again. God has guided us in, in our worship. And this morning is certainly no exception to that. I'm prepared to preach God's Word. Amen. I trust you are prepared to receive it as such. Let's open our Bibles to Nehemiah. Chapter 8, <clears throat> a very important chapter in the Word of God, such a crucial part of our study in both the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, and we're going to look at the first eight verses this morning of Nehemiah chapter 8, we'll probably have three messages from the 8th chapter of Nehemiah. This morning, I want to look at the first eight verses, and I'll read the first three for a text. So reading from Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 1, And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel, and Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women and all that could hear with understanding. Upon the first day of the seventh month, and he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday before the men and the women and those that could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. And God add his blessing to the reading of his word. We noted that under the direction of God that Nehemiah had led the people to rebuild the city walls in an astounding 52 days. In spite of all the external opposition of the enemies around them and the internal corruption of those that were within the city. And even Nehemiah's enemies in chapter 6 and verse 16 had to acknowledge that this work of Nehemiah to rebuild the wall had been wrought by God. And yet, the enemy continues to attack. Yes, Judy, the anchor holds, and the enemy never stops. But the anchor holds, and it holds, and it holds. And so the anchor held for Nehemiah and the people of God. And the enemy continued to attack, and, and the letters from Tobiah the Ammonite uh, and, the, and the corrupt uh, Jewish nobles in Jerusalem, open letters sent back and forth, all of this intending to put Nehemiah in fear in spite of the work that God had done. <clears throat> and so Nehemiah, at the conclusion of chapter 7, and we saw this last week online, but he had... Uh, appointed two godly men, one was his brother, uh, to oversee the, um, the leadership within Jerusalem as he was pre preparing to go back to Persia as he was the king's cupbearer 
and he had to return. And he instituted strict security uh, for uh, the city gates to be closed at night and appointed guards on all sections of the wall, even uh, directing men whose houses were inside that section of the wall to stand guard. You talk about your neighborhood watch program. Now it was there in Jerusalem because they were still surrounded by enemies. Um, and then God had given Nehemiah a plan to repopulate the city because there were not many Jews that were living within the city and, and to rebuild the infrastructure within Jerusalem. And he did that with this uh, by bringing forward the, the genealogy all the way back from about 100 years before from Ezra chapter 2 when Zerubbabel led the first group of exiles back. And so this listed these families uh, that had returned. And we're going to see that this plan will be instituted later on in Nehemiah. But we came to verse 73, the end of chapter 7. And the, it says that the priests and the Levites and the porters and the singers and some of the people and Nethanims, which were the temple servants, and all Israel, they dwelt in their cities. And when the seventh month came, a very important month in the history of Israel uh, with the, um, uh, the, the Feast of Trumpets on the first day, the annual Day of Atonement on the 10th day, and from the 15th to the 22nd, the Feast of the, of the Tabernacles that had been instituted in the law was to take place. So this, is, this all is coinciding with this very important religious month in the Jewish calendar, the seventh month. And so all the children of Israel were in their cities. Now we come to chapter 8, and, these, and we're just looking at these first eight verses. So then Ezra the priest now in our text, verse 1, um, or and all the people, excuse me, verse 1, gather themselves together as one man in the street. Now, you have to understand, these are, these are tens of thousands of people that are gathered together. We don't know the exact number, but this is a lot of people. Have you ever been in a worship service with over 10,000 people present? Um, I've heard some singing uh, from, from some of these big auditoriums. I I did uh, have uh, the opportunity to go to a Billy Graham crusade uh, years ago, right before he, he passed away, but we didn't make it. I was in on a temporary duty assignment with the Air Force in California, and he was in uh, Sacramento. I think it's the Arco Arena, and the chaplains uh, took a bus from the base that was about an hour or so away. And we drove up for, uh, for the service, but we didn't make it in the arena. The arena was already full, and so they had chairs set up in the parking lot. But uh, a great number of people, and just the singing that took place is, is incredible. Um, but we're, we're talking about tens of thousands of people, and they were gathered together. And it says before the water gate. Uh, there's many gates in the city of Jerusalem. Why the water gate? Well, I believe one reason, and this is just me now, but I think to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse uh, 25 and 26, when Paul commands husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word the word of God. And they met at the water gate to hear and be cleansed by the word of God. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses. Now, whether or not this is just the book of Deuteronomy or if this was... Um, all five books of, uh, of the Pentateuch. I'm not sure. And we understand when it says to Moses to bring the book of the law, he, he, didn't, he didn't have his King James Bible <laughs> to carry. We're talking about scrolls that had to be brought forth. So this is quite a, 
an event that is taking place. But either way, they brought forth the law, which the Lord had commanded to Israel, this book of the law of Moses. Now, in, since we've been in the book of Nehemiah, and, and we are in chapter 8 now, Ezra, there was no mention of him in the first seven chapters, although uh, from Ephesians, or, uh, Ezra chapter 7 to chapter 10, he, he was the main uh, player in those, in those verses. But now here in Nehemiah, this is the first mention of Ezra. And Ezra had arrived in, in Jerusalem some 14 years before Nehemiah had. And this Ezra, as, as if we look back to Ezra chapter 7 and verse 6, he also came up from Babylon, and he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses. So he was a student of the word of God. And the hand of the Lord his God was upon him. And in Ezra chapter 7 verse 10, it says that for Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and teach in Israel statutes and judgments. So this is a man that was a student of the word of God and he was also called um, to minister the word of God to others. In verse two, we see that he's the priest. He is both a scribe and a priest. And so Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding. The children, it's, you know, Jesus said, except you be converted and become as little children, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. So don't underestimate the work of the Holy Spirit in the minds and hearts of little children. You bring them to church, instruct them in the Lord. But all these that were gathered was both the men and the women and all those, the young ones, that could have, that had understanding, that could hear and receive. Um, and this was done upon the first day of the seventh month. Now this is the, the day of the Feast of, of Trumpets. And you can, in Leviticus chapter 3, verse 24, is where you see that it is, uh, it is established that in the seventh month on the first day, it'll be a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets or the Feast of Trumpets, a holy convocation. And then later in, on, on the 10th day, and reading still from Leviticus 23, verse 26, on the 10th day of the seventh month will be the day of atonement. And this is the day when the high priest uh, would 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 offer the sacrifice for his sins and the sins of his family. And then he would offer the sacrifice for the sins of the people going into the holiest of all. And you would have the scapegoat and the sacrificial goat and the blood was spilled and on the, on the sacrificial goat and, and, and put, uh, and, and, and the, and to be sacrificed for the sins, the scapegoat, the high priest would lay his hands on the goat's head and confess the sins of the people. And it was turned loose. It was turned out into the wilderness to put the sin away from the people of God. This is a, a great uh, day in the life of the children of Israel as it signified for us when Jesus Christ came and he was the eternal atonement for our sins. It's not by the blood of bulls and goats, but by all his own precious blood that he died for our sins and he cleansed us from our sins. But this pointed towards that, this day of atonement. So you can see how important this month is. And then on the 15th day of the month, uh, Leviticus 23, 34, uh, it'll be a feast of tabernacles and uh, uh, um, for seven days unto the Lord. Now, this feast of tabernacles it was a reminder to the people of God, and we're going to get into this uh, uh, in, the, in the weeks to come on this Feast of Tabernacles that they're going to observe. It was a time to remember how God had provided for the, the people of God in their wilderness wandering and how he had provided for them. And they were to dwell in these tents for seven days as a reminder of God's faithfulness to them. Uh, 
in that time of uh, wilderness wandering. Now, let me read from Deuteronomy 31, 10 through 13. Also from the law. And Moses commanded them saying, at the end of every seven years, in the Feast of Tabernacles, so according to the law, every seventh Feast of the Tabernacles, that they were to, uh, all of Israel was to appear before the Lord God in the place that he shall choose and read this law, the law of God, before all Israel in their hearing. This was supposed to happen once every seven years, according to the law. Gather the people together, men and women and children and strangers in your gate, that they may hear and that they may learn and fear the Lord your God and observe to do all the works of this law and that their children which have not known anything may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land whether you go over Jordan to possess it. Now I don't know if this was the seventh year or not but this is what Ezra did. Not only were they observing the Feast of the Tabernacles but he was opening to them and reading the law of God to them. And they were all gathered together. And in verse three, it says, and so he reads, he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday. Well, that's probably about six hours. So no more complaining about my sermon lengths anymore. <laughs> True. He's not leading the scene anymore and he still gets me that. Six hours. Of course, if you've ever done your Bible reading, you know that the law of God in the book of Moses and the, the Pentateuch, that is very lengthy anyways. So as he read, I'm sure there was stops in this, uh, probably frequent pauses, probably read in sections, uh, and they had to pause for uh, translation and explanation. I'll get to that in a minute. But so they read, he read from morning till midnight before the men and the women and those that could understand and the ears of all the people, listen to this, were attentive unto the book of the law, listening with purpose. Where's your mind at right now? The reason I say that is because I was a layman for many years and I grew up in church and I'll tell you, there was a lot of times when my mind was not on the preacher other than I hope he soon shuts up. I'm just being honest, especially as a kid. You're just looking at the clock and thinking, oh, trying to get to 12. Oh, he's going over. Ugh. But these people, as the law of God was being read, they were listening attentively. They were listening with the purpose to worship God and to understand his word. Now, all the way back in the first exile, when you had Zerubbabel, uh, the governor, that brought the first group of exiles back with him, with Jeshua the high priest, because they, they had been in exile, so it was the first return. And it this is nearly a hundred years before what's taking place right now in, in Nehemiah chapter eight. And Zerubbabel, when he came back with Jeshua, they established worship, they established uh, uh, the burnt offerings again and the feasts according to the law. The temple hadn't, was, in, was just completely destroyed. The city was destroyed. The walls were destroyed. And they came back and the first thing they did is they built an altar on the ruins and they had church. They worshiped the Lord. They instituted the sacrificial system again and instituted the feast again. Okay? Um, they, and they, at that time, it says, that they, they built the altar according to the word of God and they kept the Feast of Tabernacles. 
And it says in Ezra 3, verse 6, from the first day of the seventh month began they to offer burnt offerings unto the Lord, but the foundation of the temple was not yet laid. And then we'll see later, I, I mean, that, that was then built and completed before Ezra came. But now, okay, a, a century later, now they're, they come back, Ezra comes back, and um, he had came four, about 14 years before Nehemiah had with a second group of exiles. And Ezra had the call of God to also establish worship according to the law of God. And he began teaching the word of God. And when we went through that, we saw that a great revival took place as they had intermarried with the with the heathen nations around them, and they had cleansed themselves from that. But it, they had to be renewed again. So 14 years later now, the, all the people are gathered to hear God's word. And it says in Ezra the scribe now, so he is back now in the book of Nehemiah, and he's been there all along. But now with the leadership of Nehemiah by the direction of the Lord, with Nehemiah and Ezra, we see Ezra, the scribe, the priest. He stood up on a pulpit. I ain't going to stand on my pulpit this morning. And it's not what you think. It was more of a, uh, it was a wooden box, but it was more of a platform. It was to elevate, and we have the similar situation here, to elevate, to be able to project, for everyone to be able to see him, and that he was to read the word, which they had made for the purpose of him reading the word of God. And beside him stood 13 godly men that we really don't know anything about. Other than 13 men, maybe they were priests, maybe they were just leaders in the community but 13 godly men that stood on either side of Ezra. They stood standing for what? Standing in support, in solidarity of what was taking place. They supported Ezra in the work that God had called him to do. You remember in Exodus chapter 17, when the, the children of Israel were attacked by Amalek and Moses went up on the hilltop and Joshua went to fight the battle and up on the mountain with, went Aaron and, and uh, her with him. And as long as Moses held his hands up, the children of Israel prevailed. And when, his, and when his hands became heavy, then the children of Israel began to lose. And these two men of God stood beside Moses and they lifted up his hands and they held his hands up and God gave Israel the great victory that way. How important that was. I think of Paul when he writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 5 through 7 that when uh, uh, their mission team, when they came to Macedonia and, and Paul acknowledges that our flesh had no rest. They were, he was weak. He was weak in his flesh. He was physically exhausted. And they were troubled on every side. And we've said this many times before. When does Satan love to attack? At your weakest link and at your weakest moment. And he was hitting Paul with all he was worth. So they were, he had no rest in his flesh and they were troubled on every side. And without there were fightings and within there were fears. And then Paul says, but nevertheless, God that comforteth those that are cast down, he comforted us by the coming of Titus, the godly man that came to Paul. And in that hour of need that God gave Titus to Paul, it's the work of God that did this. It's not to glorify Titus or Paul. It's the work of God. But God called Titus to come and stand alongside Paul and support him. And Paul acknowledged that. And we, we need each other. 
And I need you, all of you. And Ezra opened the book, verse 5, in the sight of all the people. So this is corporate worship that is taking place. And he, for he was above the people on the race platform. And when he had opened it, opened the book, all the people stood up in reverence of the word of God. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. They had some genuine worship going on. It, Paul told the Thessalonian church in 1 Thessalonians 2.13 that I thank God for you without ceasing because when you received the word of God that you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God that effectually worketh also in you that believe. It's the same word of God today that takes place. And these people were worshiping, as the psalmist said in Psalm 134, Behold, bless ye the Lord, all ye servants of the Lord. Lift up your heads in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. And Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 2, 8, I will therefore that men everywhere pray, lifting up holy, hand, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Now, the purpose of our worship is not to make a spectacle of yourself in, in a worship service. But I tell you, and, I, and I'll call us Baptists here because that's our doctrinal uh, lines up with that. But us Baptists, we have let the Pentecostal movement rob us of genuine worship. No, I don't want people running up and down the aisle and distracting from what's taking place in the pulpit. But someone that lifts up a holy hand to God or says amen or praise the Lord at that appropriate time. That amen is I agree with what you're saying. That's, that's part of our worship experience. And not everybody, not everybody responds the same. Not everybody worships the same. And sure, we must be cognizant of those that are around us. And that's why I said that we, we have to be aware of that. And we don't want to become a spectacle. But when, I'm, when I am in this pulpit in preaching and I see somebody do this or somebody give an amen and I'm not prompting y'all for that. I don't believe in that kind of stuff. I'm talking about if you agree with what's being said, show something, even facial expressions. When, when I look and I scan and I see a glazed over or I see leaning forward and listening, I take notice, I see that. And, and God, he encourages me in my spirit when the people of God are attentive and they're engaged with me as we're looking at the word of God. And I have the unction of the Holy Spirit on me. I'm just a man, but I'm standing behind this pulpit right now with the word of God open before you. And I'm saying, thus saith the Lord. And it makes a difference in how we worship corporately together. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people. And the people stood up and he blessed them. And they said, Amen and Amen. And lifted their hands and bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And then we have these Levites, Jeshua and, and these other men. These are, these are Levites that they moved among the crowd, while Ezra is on the pulpit and he's preaching, that these Levites, they cause the people to understand the law. We don't have a lot of, of, of uh, details about how this took place, but I envision that these men, these Levites that were, that were trained in worship, trained in the word of God, as they, they moved among the people, possibly in smaller groups, and, and it would even uh, translate what was being said, explain uh, what was being said by Ezra. And the people stood in their places. This was the job of the priesthood. Leviticus 10, 11, Aaron and his sons were commanded by God to teach the children of Israel all the statutes of the Lord. 
In, in Deuteronomy 33.10, the Levitical priesthood is, was to teach Jacob judgments and Israel the law and put incense before them and burn, the, uh, burn sacrifices on the altar. And in, in Malachi, uh, Malachi 2 verse 7, uh, the word of God says that the priest's lips should keep knowledge and they should seek the law at his mouth. The people should seek the law at the mouth of the priest, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. And Paul told young Timothy, the pastor, Timothy, he told Timothy, till I come, Timothy, give attendance to reading and to exhortation and to doctrine. Why? So that he could feed the flock of God. That's his job. It was the job of the priest. It's the job of the pastor today. So verse eight, they read. So this is primarily Ezra reading, like I said, probably in sections. And then among the Levites, it would be repeated, translated and explained to the people. But they read in the book of the law of God distinctly and they gave the sense and caused them to understand uh, the reading. So this is in Hebrew. These people, these that were here now had been born in Babylonian captivity. Uh, so possibly their Hebrew was not very good. Uh, most of them would have spoke Aramaic at that time. So Ezra's reading the law of God in Hebrew, and then it has to be perhaps even translated at that, at that time for the people to understand what's being said and then explain what it means. And see, this is the calling of, of the pastor today. This is why... I systematically go through books of the Bible. It's for my own benefit. Yes, as I learn and grow, I told Mary, I can't believe how much I've learned of God's word in the eight years I've been a pastor. And in and, and, and heart, heart, broke, broken heartedness, I say, I so wish I had, I had studied God's word like this all of my life because it's so important. But that's why I have the conviction to, for us to, to, to do it this way so that we can know the word of God as we go through it. Well, let's wrap up with this. Let me go to the Psalms and in one New Testament passage, Psalms 1. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly or stands in the way of sinners nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. And this is to the people of God. But his delight and her delight, our delight, is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. And one group of Christians in the New Testament that I think and I know that God's word gives us that this is how we are to worship. Acts 17 verse 11, the Berean believers, they were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word of God with all readiness of mind. And it says, and they searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Therefore, many of them believed also of honorable women with the Greeks and of men, not a few. It's not a job for just the pastor. It's not a job for just the, the leaders in the church, the men of the church, and men and women, boys and girls. To study God's word for yourself, don't take my word for it. Study it and read it for yourself. Jot down the scriptures, look them up, ask questions. I might not have the answer, but we'll look for it together. For our worship to be the way it's supposed to be. As week in and week out, we open up the holy and inspired word of God and ask God to change my life with your word, by the power of your Holy Spirit, to be the men and women 
and to be the church that God would have us to be. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your holy word. I pray that your will would be accomplished in each in each person's life, both here and that will hear this message. Have your way. Guide us, lead us, instruct us, change us for your glory and our good. In Jesus' name, amen.